Welcome back to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. We have again with us blogger Al Robinson, Hat City Blog, and Mark Morash, my co-host. And for lack of a better term, I think we're going to be doing a little bit of town committee um, beaten up today. <laughs> because we've got two political parties, and, and we know that 70% of American voters are, are pretty much not wanting the two candidates that are up there for president. So some, there's a disconnect there. And the majority of Americans, it's above 50% now, are unaffiliated, or in the case of Connecticut, unaffiliated. In the case of other states, independent. And uh, there's, there's a huge cry out there for more political parties that cover more than just what the two parties, which are seem to have become closer and closer to one another on anything and everything except maybe a couple of social issues. But uh, first of all, Al Robinson, introduce yourself and then we'll get started. All right, well, good to be here again. And uh, I've been uh, blogging in this area for over 10 years under uh, Hat City Blog. I also do, um, I also have a site, uh, a, a website over affiliate with the Danbury News Times, the Hearst Newspapers. And, uh, you know, I got active in politics a very, very long time ago. My, I'm originally from Hartford and um, dealt with a lot of Hartford politics, then moved down here to Danbury and got really upset after um, the Bush-Gore election and then the Iraq war really fired me up. And I, uh, so I decided to pick up my camera and use my knowledge from uh, journalism in college and my experience in journalism to... Uh, um, put my money where my mouth is and uh, follow um, these political guys and do some blogging. And, and a, uh, good, a good friend of Ned Lamont's and had a lot to do with Ned Lamont's campaign, which did not ultimately succeed. But as you say, it gave people an opportunity to be anti-war that maybe were afraid to do that before then. Yeah. And um, Mark, hold up your... Um, I want to see the, the magazine that, that Mark does that... Um, Good morning, and it's a very appropriately named uh, uh, periodical that, um, that gives a lot of a good political insight into, um, and social insight to the area. But uh, go ahead, continue the conversation. Let's talk about the two political parties locally. And you don't, don't hold back. You can name <laughs> names if you want to. I've got to say one thing, though, about yeah. the fact that you, know, you mentioned, of course, the Danbury News Times is a Hearst paper. And, and what a Hearst paper is has changed over the last hundred years, certainly. But... I love the fact that you're writing the good, you're fighting the good fight through a Hearst newspaper, kind of wiping a little bit of William Randolph Hearst's history mm -hmm. out of the world, because he and Art Young, who founded Good Morning back in 1919, were always like this, and there's a huge history at that beginning of yellow journalism and Art Young's uh, magazine, and he worked for Hearst. Hearst wanted him for years, and Hearst's editor, Arthur Brisbane, who used to write these amazingly almost progressive columns in Hearst's paper, which was weird because you wouldn't expect that. Um, Brisbane was very much about the common person, and he would take Art's cartoons and write these big eight-column tabloid conversations. They would have these conversations back and forth, almost across party lines, so to speak, that you never see in the newspaper anymore. It was a conversation about how to make things better for people. And it was in a Hearst paper. So it's, I love the continuation of the lineage. In a nonpartisan sense, you say? And it, it, seriously, in a nonpartisan sense, because Hearst, of course, with the yellow journalism, was all about sensationalism. Yep. And was very much, you know, you know, money and corporate and the whole thing. And Brisbane, who was his editor for decades, was very much people on the street. And he had a very congenial writing style where he would take a topic that was going on and he would just start rambling, very, very unique style for the age, very, inter, very interactive. And he tried for years to get Art Young on Hearst's payroll to be his personal illustrator, and Art wouldn't do it. But every once in a while, Brisbane would say, hey, you know, can you illustrate something along these lines? And Art would do his drawing, and they would publish it, big eight, you know, huge tabloid size, and Brisbane would write about it. And this conversation would go back and forth, even though they were diametrically opposed for the most part, because Art Young was essentially a socialist. But Brisbane, he, you know, you couldn't, if he was alive today, you wouldn't call him right wing. You, he had too much heart in him. He just, 
he just happened to be this powerful editor under what was essentially the biggest newspaper empire. It's a completely unique thing, and if I ever had the time for, to do all the research, it would be a great be a great biography to write mm -hmm. of the two of them in, for this day and age, because we don't see it. Everyone's so split, and it's so either or, that you don't get those beautiful dialogues anymore. And you used to see those back in the day um, with, with a fellow named William Buckley, mm -hmm. who was an arch conservative, but at the same time, he enjoyed a good conversation, as did the folks that he had conversations with that didn't agree with him. But they would have these conversations where both would make their points and be respectful of one another. And you didn't have these uh, debate-type situations like we have now, as we're seeing unfold in the uh, presidential debates. And it's, it's just a pity not to be able to see people respectfully talking about issues rather than personalities. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that we have less than 40 days to go, at least on the presidential level, uh, less than 40 days to go, and we don't know a lot of positions or solutions that Donald Trump would have to tackle a lot of these issues because he's talking about things that actually make no sense. They're just so far off, off, off the reservation. Yep. And it's more of just pure mudslinging versus, hey, you know, I haven't heard anybody talk about this, the problem in Syria. Syria's not going any way any, anytime soon. You know, and in my opinion, the Syrian issue is going to be um, Barack Obama's, you know, Rwanda mm -hmm. uh, or Bosnia. I mean, it's a horrific situation that's going on there that it has to be addressed. Nobody's talking about that. Um, you know, there are a lot of major, major problems that are happening in this country from decent drinking water mm -hmm. to our infrastructure falling apart. And we're not talking about these issues. We're talking about things that, you know, I won't even bring up on a local access show because it's so horrific that I'm actually seeing it on primetime TV. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to my dog like, hold your ears. This is kind of crazy right now. And it's, it's unfortunate. And that's what that the media seems to like. They like this. Well, uh, you know, it's what, it's what got them 80 whatever million viewers, and not me, by the way. But um, and, and yeah. I, watched the, uh, I watched bits and pieces of the debate, some of the questions on Democracy Now!, which is a good TV show, uh, that had uh, some questions where each of the two candidates that were actually at the debate got an opportunity to answer in their two-minute slot. And then Jill Stein, the uh, Green Party candidate, had two minutes to answer also. Would have loved to have seen Gary Johnson there, and uh, unfortunately he couldn't make it, but you know, that's the kind of thing we need to see, and that's why there should have been four candidates talking about issues, because the other two could have kept the two major candidates on focus on what are the real issues of today. It, sometimes it does work. I remember back during the uh, 2006 when uh, the debates happened between Lamont and Lieberman, there was mm -hmm. the one famous debate that happened um, in Hartford where they had all the candidates up there. I was there, yep. And it was, that was a very interesting debate. And, uh, and again, it, it, it does work. It, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't work because you have these, sometimes you have really fringe candidates mm -hmm. who really don't need to be up there, just taking up time. Um, so it, it, it goes both ways, it, at least that's my opinion. For something like Syria, we're getting off the, we were going to get onto the local and town committee thing, but for something like Syria, when there's an issue where it feels as if nobody who's available to vote for has a solution, do you think that's part of the reason why they just sort of hide it? that they just leave it out here as if we're all not going to notice? Because you wind up with so many issues and you think, well, I guess we want these five and that's going to cut. And, and I mean, as so many people have talked about, we're dealing with this lesser of two evils, lesser of four evils, whatever it is. And in some way, it's not only hurting us as voters domestically, but it's hurting that feel of, of global politics. I think that a lot of people feel when they look at their candidates, they're like, hey, you know, I want to see what type of rabbit you're pulling out of your hat to solve these solutions. And then people think that, you know, for every issue, for every problem that these candidates should be able to pull out a rabbit and here's our solution. And it doesn't work like that. Yeah. And the candidates know it doesn't work like that, but they have to give the impression that they're pulling a rabbit out of the hat. When, you know, I don't care who's president, <laughs> the president's job is to do this. 
Sign, sign bills. <laughs> Congress is where the stuff gets done. You know, so he could say, he or she could say whatever they want to say. It ain't going to fly because Congress is the people who do that. And, and, and uh, so, but again, we live in a fast food society where everybody wants their stuff microwave and they want their solutions real fast. And like, what are you going to do for me? And they have to come up with something or else they're not going to get that vote. So now, presidents, presidents have the right, they have the power, and, and every president is used as power regardless of whether anybody wants to say it's just Barack Obama that's done it. Um, every president's used that executive order to accomplish things, and usually it's when there's an obvious solution to something, and yet Congress is gridlocked on things that are of no consequence to anybody, and a president steps in and does something, and Congress does not have the ability nor the, the gumption to, uh, to override that decision or to do something different. So the president sometimes has to step in to do these things. Sometimes, and then you have really strong presidents like Lyndon Johnson, who, uh, for good or for bad, got he things pushed through, done he pushed through Congress. Through his deal. Mm. He worked with Congress to get the job done. Yeah. A lot of his stuff came through. And Ronald Reagan, for good or for bad, his relationship with Tip O'Neill was instrumental for a lot of his passage of his, of his uh, legislation through his years, at least through the first term. Structurally, absolutely true. We won't agree on, on anything good about Ronald Reagan, but no, you're right about that. No, Structurally, he knew how, he had the ability to talk to people in private, and they did accomplish, good, bad, or otherwise, they did accomplish some things. I was, I mean, good, good or bad, but it was his agenda, mm -hmm. I would want to say. He, he was able to work it through. And, and when he got shot, that didn't hurt either. Well, of course. But, you know, Everybody I, felt sorry for him, and that was always, that's always a good, uh, good way to get, get what you want passed, is when you're lying in a hospital bed and, and you know. Well, unfortunately, though, you, you, it's ironic that we, we, you brought that topic up, but it's still uh, another big topic in this area is gun control, mm -hmm. because of the Stanley Hook shootings, and it's amazing that the Brady Bill and the, and the spirit of the Brady Bill is still being debated after all these years. And I think it's another big topic that we have to address. We have to address, we have to address gun control. We have to address everything that's associated with that. It's a and serious let me problem. throw in, let me throw in, we have to address unarmed black civilians being killed by, granted, the minority of police officers in America that are bad seeds, but there are out there and unfortunately you have um, too much of good police officers hiding bad police officers from their from what should be their just desserts. Yeah, well that's been going on for a very, very long True. time. Nothing you know, new there. Now, nothing just gets, new. now it's just getting caught on camera thanks to, uh, to bloggers and folks that, that you know happen to be there and have a camera available. Well, not, not only to, a camera, but you know, I mean, remember Rodney King, the person had a VCR camera like this, but now yeah. you got these people with cell phones who were able to catch, catch stuff, or, or even the case of the poor woman in the, uh, I think she was in Illinois, who captured her boyfriend shot by a police officer live. She was broadcasting it live on Facebook. Yep. Um, so the times have changed, and due to the fact that times have changed, a lot more of these instances are popping up because yep. people have access to uh, social media so they can show a lot more of this stuff. Correct. The um, fact that they're happening is nothing new. The fact that they're, the fact that they're being put on the public domain and people have to face up to these incidents is relatively new. And it's just a, not that they haven't happened before throughout history, right. but these, uh, these incidents are at least getting their due attention now. Yeah, and I don't think those are, those are issues that I like to hear a lot more of on a, not only a president on a presidential level, but on the congressional level. Again, I'm at gun control, Fifth mm -hmm. District, Newtown. We should be talking about that. You know, where do you stand on that? Are you for gun control, or if you're not for gun control? Are you, or, or if you're not for gun control, where can we, where can we strike a compromise? Can we get something done? Because right now we're not getting anything done, and I think that's a huge, huge problem. Um, you know, because I lived in Newtown. I lived not, I, I lived for several years, not far away from that school. And the day that it happened, I'm st I was just shocked. I'm like, Newtown, Sandy Hook? You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. And um, it, it happened right here. And um, all, it it takes is, all it takes is one person with an agenda that's bad or with a mental illness right. to have access to a, a weapon, and we'll call them weapons of mass destruction because that's what they are, that have that has access to a weapon that you can kill 26 people in less than three minutes where there's a minimum of three bullet holes in each of the victims. Right. And yeah. that's just, that's just, nobody needs to have a weapon like that anywhere. 
And it's not a hunting weapon by any means. And, and those are the topics we need to be talking about. Um, and especially, in the, well, for instance, the second, congre- uh, the second uh, state senate district, uh, Dan Carter, mm-hmm. who was one of the only, one of the very few Republicans in Greater Danbury, who voted against it. And the second district covers Newtown. Yeah, he had part of Newtown in his district. Yeah, mind-boggling that he would vote in that manner. And he's going. He's running for U.S. Uh, U.S. Senate now, and and you know I'll, I'll make the prediction now. He'll lose. Well, <laughs> you mentioned in the first He'll show about lose. about placeholders, and you see a lot of this, and yeah. and and this leads back leads us back to the the notion that that both political parties quite often will not run candidates that are really viable candidates. They're placeholders. Yeah, we have a lot of them right now in this area. I mean, we have a we have a candidate running for state senate on the Democratic side who who's Leaps and bounds, not qualified, and whatsoever. I mean, he has a he has a good talk and a gift of gab, but he's the most one of the most unqualified individuals I've ever seen running for state senate. If you look, at, you put him compared to Alice Hutchinson and Dwayne Perkins mm-hmm. and, and Jason Bartlett, and you have Ken Gucker who couldn't even win a spot on the zoning board. And you know, election after election, he got less and less votes, and and they're putting him up there because. The town committee cannot find viable candidates to run for these positions. So and every, and every, every, every town committee, every, town, every committee. town, whether they're Republican or Democratic town committees, yeah. they should be able to find a good viable candidate Again, and, for and, every and, and, single and, election. In the one tenth, in the one tenth on the Republican side, we, mm-hmm. we just talked about it again uh, in the previous uh, show. You know, Bob Godfrey, who had landslides, mm-hmm. landslide winnings against his opponents because these people were just basically placeholders. Yep. They come up for they come up, they run for election, they they do these things for a few months, they run, and then next thing you know, phew, gone, mm-hmm. like like gone, gone. And like you don't see him anywhere. You don't see him running for any other office. You, you, I bet you couldn't even name three of the people who ran against Bob Godfrey because they're nowhere to be found anymore. Yeah. And it's the same thing on the Democratic side. They bring these people up here. They have no experience whatsoever, no political experience, or they have some political experience, or, or better yet, they have a certain last name that uh, is affiliated with Danbury old, mm-hmm. uh, Danbury old timers. Well, you, well, you made a good point. It's, you it's made ridiculous. a good point about um, about there being two good candidates in the hundred and tenth with Bob Godfrey and and uh, Daniela uh, uh, Emanuel Palmeira. Emanuel Palmeira being two pretty good candidates, at least uh, able to speak clearly and talk to the issues clearly. How about in the second, where you have a uh, uh, Rahab Ali Brennan and uh, Will Duff? And Will Duff pretty much represents his predecessor, Dan Carter, in terms of um, in terms of what he stands for and what his beliefs are. How does that match up as far as? Um, um, it's an interesting district. It leans a lot more to the to the Republican side now. After the redrawing a few years ago, yep. um, I personally thought that Candace Faye, who ran uh, one cycle ago against Dan Carter, would fare, fare much better, mm-hmm. given the fact that Dan Carter, like we said before, voted against gun control. Yeah, and um, Dan Carter was able to win. Um, I, I think it leans a little to the Republican side. We still have a lot of time left. These 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 candidates right now. Now is the time. October, late September, and October. Now is the time. These candidates are coming out there. They're doing debates. They're talking a lot more about the issues. And you get a better understanding of where they stand out on the issues. And this is m- more the time where people are paying a lot more attention. So that's a case so, where, where you have where you have two worthwhile candidates going against one another. At least candidates that yeah. you can differentiate between fairly clearly. Um, how I, about I, I, how about some of the races around the area? Because, for instance, in well, the um, in the hundred and seventh, again, and this this is historical. Where yeah, it's just, I didn't say hysterical; I said historical. It's not yeah. hysterical at all. But it's, disgrace, um, it's disgraceful. You have you had a Republican not being opposed by a Democratic Party candidate um, for pretty much pretty much for uh, twenty plus years. Yeah, and, and the only and and I'm sitting in the chair of the guy with, that was the only one that actually ran. And granted I only got thirty five percent, but at least I was a candidate they had a candidate in the race with me. And and this time around we're back to the same old Brookfield Democratic Town Committee having no interest apparently in having a a candidate against a guy, Steve uh, Steve Harding, who seems fairly vulnerable in terms of he still lacks a lot of experience. There's a lot of, you know, there should be somebody out there that could go up against him in a debate and have a good discussion with him and talk about the issues. And there's no, no discussion. Well, I mean, with, even when you ran, you ran against Scribner, and Scribner had a ton of baggage. 
You know, yeah. I meant, you know, the lean on his house, his funny, I mean, you know, the problem with him being a treasurer of Brookfield, yeah, this guy, he, yeah. he was running state rep. I mean, time and time again, it's a disappointment in the 107th. And, 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 and 107 is also income, it also the portion of Danbury's in the 107th. A little bit of Danbury's there now, And yep. when you have the, the Republican town committee, I mean, sorry, the Democratic town committee here in Danbury saying that we have a full slate, we have a full slate. I'm like, wait a second, you don't have a full slate. You have, you, have, you have the 107th, it's empty, mm -hmm. and you know they can say, well, it's just a minor part of the 107th. Well, I'm like, wait, wait a second, Candace Fay, who is from Danbury, ran in the second district one cycle ago, mm -hmm. and you know all the, all the majority of the second is in Bethel. Mm -hmm. you know, so I don't want to hear about the whole full slate nonsense, and you start promoting this nonsense like this. We need viable candidates, and, and especially in the 107s, where it's you know Republican after Republican after Republican. Especially with the stuff that happened in Brookfield over the last cycle with the Republican Party, um, and, and the amateur nonsense of Matt Grimes and, and the former first selectman. Maybe there is a time for the change, and you should give those people an opportunity to choose between two candidates and not just mm -hmm. not run anybody at all. So, so again, back to the original question, and I'll, I'll let you yes, address that. Yeah. Exactly. Back to, back to the original question, what is wrong with the Republican and Democratic town committees, not just locally, but statewide, and perhaps even nationwide, that they don't, they can't find viable candidates to run? Well, can they not find, or do they want to keep the gates closed? I mean, here we are, mm -hmm. in the last few minutes, we've talked about the ridiculousness of the Democrats in Brookfield. We've talked about the, the inability to organize of the Democrats in Danbury. You've got Bethel, where yes, you have a first selectman who's a Democrat, but everything else down ticket is Republican. Mm -hmm. And so you look at this, and you have the fact that it is believed that District 5 in the presidential election is going to go Trump. So you're talking about the fact that the, the Duff, that that election, you know, it's leaning Republican. So what are we really seeing locally? Are we seeing that the area is starting to lean more Republican? Or are we watching the Democrats completely drop the ball? If you, and, could, if you could consider Trump a Republican, I'm, yeah, not, well, sure, but I'm not sure what he, he is. But. He, he's he's his, own, his own thing. So yeah. here's the thing. So we were talking, you know, mm -hmm. we were talking, you know, before the show how in the Connecticut primaries before April 26, there were a bunch of us working for the Bernie Sanders campaign. And, you know, I, when my hat was on, there were buttons, you know. So, you know, I'm a Bernie guy, still am a Bernie guy, always will be a Bernie guy. But we wanted to use the Danbury office to run the canvassing out of, and they said no. They said no, flat out no. Which was interesting because in Stamford, they asked if they could use the Democratic uh, office there, and they said yes, because they realize they want all of these youth who have never been involved before, or us older folks who have never been involved before on this level, to still want to be there after the primaries. They realize the good, the idea of opening, open the gates, let people in. Well, Danbury said no. Then the regime changed about a week before the Connecticut primary, and two days before the primary on Sunday, somebody showed up at our canvassing office and said, hey, can we have a bunch of Bernie stuff to put outside at, at the Danbury office? And you think, where have you been for the last few weeks when we, we were asking to work with you? And so if I were to, and I don't want to, I, I, besides last, last week I already said I'm running for president in 20, we all declared for 2020, <laughs> we're gonna start our growing campaign, start getting signatures now. So I can't run locally, so don't ask. But if I wanted to run locally and just showed up two months ago and said, hey, I'm considering being on the ticket, they wouldn't know me, and they wouldn't just let me do it. I mean, granted, you have to vet and all that, and I get that, but there is there is a, a, a maze and a gatekeeping process, and find your way through the, through the corn maze around Halloween and get me a coffee next February, that you're blocking out people that want to be involved, and you're also not mentoring, and that's really what it comes down to. When, when the Bernie delegates came back from Philadelphia, there was a meeting of a bunch of folks locally, and there were folks half my age there. Now, I'm only 40, and there were folks half my age who had been delegates down in Philadelphia, and I thought, oh my goodness gracious, you guys are amazing that you're doing this. And you want there to be, and maybe there aren't, maybe there really aren't people already involved in politics locally to mentor them. And frankly, the heads on their shoulders didn't even feel like they needed it because they're already just well on their way. But you think to yourself, 
if the gates closed, what do we have to do to make sure these, these kids, it's weird saying kids because I feel like I'm 18, um, but to make sure they have all of our support going forward. And yeah. if the two major parties aren't going to be inclusive, perhaps this reflects and will give a push forward for there being more major political parties. Because if there's, if there's no seat at the table in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, as we have learned, yeah. For a lot of people that are that are leaning in your direction and wanna wanna be part of the action and wanna be part and don't want to spend twenty years stuffing envelopes to get there that have something to bring to the table right now, if the two major parties won't do that, then that's why more than half of Americans register as unaffiliated or Independent yeah, as yeah. We need a chair right here that's the chair that represents pulling up another chair to the table in politics and locally and in this country because that's the biggest thing that's missing is you walk up and there's nowhere to sit. Yes. And yeah. sometimes you can grab a chair and plunk it down and be like, I'm going to be here. And other times, as we well know, it doesn't work that way because there are layers of getting ballot access. Yeah. And that's what we need to help really engender in the community I mean, on all levels. I mean, when you have, like, in the last the last cycle in the second district in Bethel, you know, when Candace Hay was out there mm -hmm. run, run, trying to run for re-election, uh, trying to run for re uh, election, trying to beat Dan Carter, and you had the Bethel Democratic Town Committee didn't even open a headquarters in Bethel. You know, how out outlandish is that? You keep, I mean, you want to attract these people to come out here and, and learn about these parties, but you don't even have a headquarters open. And, you know, that just, that just goes more into, like, you know, the, this old party system, whether it's Danbury and, and, and the insanity that's happened in that town committee or in Bessel. You know, they, they think they're the smartest people in the room. And what they're doing is just alienating people that should be coming into the Democratic town committees, learning more about the Democratic Party. And you might find within those people who are coming in great candidates who can run for office, not only on a state level, but more importantly on a local level. As we wind down, after November 8th, after the election is over, I think you're going to find a lot, of, a lot of demand for a new third party. It might be a coalition party, might be some libertarians, might be some liberals, might be folks that, that can sit down and talk to one another and want to present a better option to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And with that, this has been Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson. Al Robinson, always good for a great conversation. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Mark Moresh, a marvelous yeah. co-host. Thank you very awesome. much. Love that. Enjoy your day.